Super glad to be here. I love JavaScript. I, uh, I'm a software engineer at Lucid Software. We're here in South Jordan. We make LucidChart, a cloud diagramming product, and uh, Lucid Press, a cloud design and layout product. And we have a lot of JavaScript in our code base. It's constantly evolving. We have a lot of homegrown code. We use both Angular 1 and 2 right now. So we uh, constantly strive to improve our code and just manage the hundreds of thousands of lines of code that we have. So I'm going to talk about readable code today. Um, code that's hard to read causes the who the heck wrote this moments. You know, pr pr probably all of you have experienced that. And that code is error prone. It's intimidating. People that have to work with code that's hard to read, they, they tend to really not they're afraid to refactor it. They work around it. They put Band-Aid fixes on it without really understanding it, uh, which uh, increases technical debt. And it's taxing uh, as far as the time it takes to understand that code every time. So uh, we should all try to write more readable code. And uh, our goal here should be to write code that minimizes the time it would take someone to understand it. And uh, important note here, that someone might be you in six months. Like, how many of you have, like, have had this who the heck wrote this moment and then realized, oh, that was me a few months ago? So uh, today I'm going to talk, obviously this is a giant topic. Uh, I'm going to talk just about a collection of things that are my pet peeves that I see a lot in the code base. Uh, it's going to be not as much code architecture in general, but Things like naming, formatting, uh, when do you comment, do you need to comment code? Uh, there's, there's a big debate about that. Um, so let's start. Now, formatting. Um, all of you, I'm sure, have written code here, so I'm not going to talk about basic things like, well, you got to indent your code, you got to be consistent uh, in white space. But two things that I would like to stress is, one, you do have to have a style guide. You need to document it somewhere, put it in your company wiki, and stick to it. So whatever your preferences are, you got to be consistent. Everybody in your company has to be on board with it. And the second thing that just kills me a lot is line length. Uh, you do need to have a sane limit for line length. Uh, now, back in the old day, people used to use terminals like that. And all software companies enforced uh, the 80 character line limit because the, those CRT screens would be 80 by 25 characters. You couldn't fit more. And so you had to, that, that was a hard limit, 80 characters per line, or it would be just hard to read the code. Uh, but now we have giant screens. You know, maybe five years from now, everybody will be developing on screens that are as big as, as, big as this projector screen. Uh, so does that mean we don't have to care about line length anymore? Well. You have a giant screen, that's great. Well, how about you fit multiple files in it? Uh, I often like having a two or even three column view in my text editor, working on several files at the same time. In the front end world, it's often your JavaScript and CSS or JavaScript and a template. Uh, so it's, having a big screen is not really a good excuse for having super long lines. Or you know, sometimes you might be on a laptop screen. Maybe you're on the go. Maybe you just decided to take a break and sit on the couch. You don't have your big screen on. And of course, you work on a team. Maybe you have a giant screen, but your, your buddy reviewing your code is on a laptop. Uh, and lastly, well, long lines are just hard to read. Even, even if you do have a big screen, like there's, there's a giant screen right there in the hallway, uh, don't make lines that are as long as that guy. Uh, they're just hard to read. You know, we, with, with the way we read text, we, our, our eye likes moving top to, to bottom and a little bit left to right. When there's too much left to right, it, it becomes uncomfortable. And in typography, they, they have this concept. Uh, they advise that you should generally have 45 to 90 characters per line, which really aligns with this old-fashioned standard of 80 characters per line. Well, we do have bigger screens now, maybe we can bump it up to 100, 120, 140 lines, but I, I wouldn't really go more than 140 characters per line. That's just too long. So don't make lines like this. Uh, like, uh, don't make your coworker scroll every time they need to figure out what's going on in the function. And again, this, this might be bug prone because you don't know what's at the end and you might skip it. 
So do, do, do format uh, your code to have shorter lines. So if you have a bunch of parameters in a function, uh, split them up uh, to be one per each line. Next thing, a uh, big topic, commenting. Uh, many people are convinced that you should write code that doesn't require comments. Uh, and I generally agree with that. I think our, our, our goal, our, our ideal should be your code should not need comments because comments often get out of date or often we comment code that just really needs to be refactored. And instead of refactoring the code, we just add a comment explaining how complicated it works or why, why it's so ugly. Um, of course, uh, uh, in real life, we sometimes do have to put comments in code, but I do think that comments in general gravitate toward code that's questionable. Um, for example, what does this function do? If you have just five seconds to look at that code, do you immediately see what it does? Maybe you do if you've done a lot of front-end work, but it, it's, it's not immediately obvious, right? This, this snippet of code does the, implements the infinite scrolling. When you scroll to the bottom of the, the page, we maybe load more content, more pictures, or more news. Um, so you, you could be motivated to just add a comment, say, oh, this is infinite scrolling. So you kind of show that this, this block of code is responsible for infinite scrolling. But what would be even better is, hey, what if we assign this function, this callback function, to a variable called infinite scroll handler? You know, and that way, we don't need the comment. It's, it's in the variable name. So look out for things like that, and when, when you when you're tempted to write a comment, think, can I change the code to be more obvious? Um, there's often comments like that that don't really add knowledge. Generally, if the code is straightforward, you, the, the, there's no sense of repeating that uh, in, in a comment. Uh, maybe when you're initially developing that code, you had your thought process, and you put a bunch of comments, I'm going to do this here, I'm going to do that here, and then you actually fill those blanks with code. Uh, but yeah, comments like that are unnecessary and often misleading because you might change the code and not change the comment. Um, sometimes we do, so this is an example of when we have to add a comment. So I, I was doing some front-end work and I needed to change the style of an input placeholder, and you can do it with modern browsers using selectors like that. But turns out you cannot group these selectors, you know, you cannot turn it into one selector and uh, just use comma to separate these uh, selectors for different browsers. Turns out you can't do that. Uh, at least Chrome and Firefox would not read that. So this is an example of where you do want to put a comment because maybe your coworker will be using that code and he'll think, oh, that water waste of space. I'm going to combine all these selectors. And then he would, he would break the, the view. Um, so unfortunately, in, in the real world, there, there is place for comments like that, but um, another thing that I uh, like to think about, if I have a comment explaining what's happening or what's going to happen, if the code is relatively complicated, maybe I should consider turning it into a log statement. So I have this comment, uh, the main policy found, we're going to add the user to an existing account. You might, you might win in two places if you turn that into a log statement. You know, that way we still explain what the code does to the reader and we add some useful logging. Uh, so often comments should really change into log statements. Uh, another big topic, naming things. Everybody's favorite, right? Uh, there, there, there are holy wars on that uh, every other day. Now, uh, in my practice, I found that there are some uh, words that are just always ambiguous, or almost always. Let's look at that code. What do you think it does? Team user provisioner process login. Does somebody want to take a stab at it? What, what do you think this method does? It processes login, right? It clear as mud. Uh, well. Turns out that this, uh, this method does a lot of things, and this is a real example from our code base. Um, it's a sort of a post-registration action that when we create a new user, we want to make sure that we put them on the right account, we set the right 
metadata on their account and maybe we set some cookies. So it does a lot of things and I guess the person writing that piece of code did not, could not think of a more concrete way of uh, naming this method because it does a lot of things. And so they call it process. Um, so watch out for these words. If, you ha if, if, if you're tempted to use a word like that in your uh, variable or method name, think twice. These are almost always ambiguous and do not really communicate what, what your method does. So I took some time to think about the alternatives. So validate form is a really big offender. You, I see this a lot in the code, uh, different people's code. People would say uh, validate form or check form. Uh, that doesn't really communicate what's the outcome of this operation. Are we validating the form and submitting it or are we just returning some errors? Are we returning some errors in, the, in an array or are we just alerting the user in the GUI that they have errors in the form? So try, uh, uh, more specific examples of um, a, a method that does some sort of form validation would be get errors. You know, when you look at this method, it's super clear that method will return me probably an array or a map of errors. Or if I, if I just want to know if my form is valid, well, just have a method that is valid and you know that it returns true or false. There's no ambiguity here. Uh, or in some web frameworks, uh, the way you process a form, you call something like bind from request and then it may take two callbacks, a callback if the form is valid and then a callback if the form is invalid. Um, getters and setters are another uh, big, big area where it's, it may not be obvious what your, your get, get method does. For example, get token, right? Authentication token. Um, wh where do we get this token? Maybe it's a method on a user object on your server side or a special authentication object. Uh, so it's not, it's not a mistake that I have get token in both left and right columns. Now, if I have a user object and that user object already has a token field on it that somehow got there and all I want to do is retrieve that value, get token is probably totally fine. I think the general convention is that your get and set methods should be just simple, your get methods should be simple lightweight accessors for the data that's already there, just like user.getName or user.getEmail. However, if we're, if we're trying to retrieve information from an external source, you know, that's potentially a costly operation, get is, is really not a good idea. You really want to communicate that we're going to download data from, read it from a database or download it from another server. So something like fetch would be a better name. Or if we're generating a token, again, it could be a computationally intensive operation. Let's communicate that. Let's say generate token or create token. So consider using uh, names like that. Another example, of course, this is specific because it's hard to talk about these names in general. In each application, you would have uh, your specific business logic, and that's precisely why it's not a good idea to just say check or process or validate. Um, for example, we have this method called check restricted plugins, uh, and we have a diagram editor, and it loads, and then some plugins are uh, restricted. You have to have a pro subscription to use them. So check restricted, restricted plugins, again, does not communicate what happens when we check. Turns out that what this method in the code base actually did is it alerted the user saying, hey, you need a pro subscription to, to use this plugin that you're trying to use. So really a better name for that method would have been something like alert if restricted plugins or alert about restricted plugins. Um, and finally, the, the process login example that I uh, used before, a better name for that would have been something like run post-registration actions. And yes, this is generic, but the reason that uh, why we would want to even create this, this method with such a name is if we want to use it in multiple places. And it would be specific to how we in our product run uh, post-registration actions. But it's still more 
it still communicates more than just process login. You're not even sure if process login is about logging in or registering a new user. It turns out that it's actually about registration. Uh, so do think about things like that. Uh, use a dictionary, use a coworker. I think an extra five or 10 minutes you spend coming up with a better name will go a long way uh, in, in the future will uh, reduce that maintenance, that extra technical debt that a confusing name would, would have. Um, also, another good rule of thumb, if you can't come up with a verb, uh, your method is probably doing too much, and you need to split it up in several methods. Uh, may sound obvious, but there's numerous examples of uh, functions that are overloaded because they were named something like check or process or make. And people thought, well, what I'm doing really fits this method. So instead of making a new method, I'm going to add another thing that this check or process routine will do. I'm processing data, right? <laughs> Programming is all about processing data uh, in a way. Uh, and here's a quote that I like from uh, a GitHub page, idiomatic.js, that contains just good practices about uh, writing a consistent idiomatic code. All code base should look like a single person wrote it, no matter how big the project is, no matter how many people contributed to that, whether you're a five person or 500 or 5,000 uh, people organization. Uh, so in some cases, you would have conventions. Uh, different frameworks would use different verbs in a certain way, all these check and validate and other things. Uh, so you may have a lingo that you use in your organization, and everybody understands what that is. Um, so consistency does matter. So using Booleans, I, I think this deserves a separate topic. Uh, specifically naming them. Here's another what does this do snippet. So uh, what do you think the, does this method do? Show OneDrive import. Anyone wants to take a guess? Yeah, so it's something about Microsoft OneDrive. What do you think this method does in, in, in the product? Show OneDrive import, import. Show what file is imported. Show what file is imported. You know, or maybe show a dialog for the import, right? Well, uh, turns out that in our code, this is again an example from our code base. Turns out that this method really returns a Boolean that says whether we should show the import dialog or no. Again, the, once you see the code, it's, it's kind of obvious, but it's not obvious to the user of a method. It's not obvious uh, if you read a place where this method is called. Um, so this, this brings me to an important point. When you have a variable or a function that returns a Boolean, make it crystal clear that this function or this value holds a Boolean. It can only be true or false. It doesn't do anything else. It doesn't have side effects. It returns true or false. Um, so good examples like this are should show one, one, one drive import. That, that would have been clearer. Uh, so use prefixes like is, has, can. That makes it super clear that this is a Boolean, that this doesn't actually show a dialog or uh, toggle something. It just gives you true or false. Uh, so another thing, who heard about the Boolean trap? And here's an example of it. And the, this is a, the, the, I'm going to have more examples like this. What does this code do? Well, we, from the name, we, kinda, we can guess that. Well, it probably returns an SVG for, for a page in a document. But what are these true and false parameters are? The first parameter I can kind of guess, DPI. That makes sense. We, you need to, if you export to SVG, you need DPI for images. But... I have no idea what these true and false parameters are. And I have to look up the definition and uh, and takes takes extra time to do that. And I might mess it up easily. Sometimes there are methods that have five Boolean parameters in different orders. And it's just true, false, true, false. It's, it's unmanageable. So certain languages have named parameters. Uh, JavaScript doesn't. Uh, but you have objects. So one way of de-obfuscating that, and I strongly encourage you to do that, is by passing an object to a function that, that takes Booleans. Especially if you have a method that takes more than, say, 
for arguments, you should consider using an object anyway because it just gets unwieldy. You have a long line. You have to remember what, what to pass and in what order. Objects really are better for this. And they, they, they do have a couple of downsides, like uh, it, it's, it's harder to process. You pass an object and uh, you need to then retrieve values from an object or if you're trying to enforce type safety through Google Closure Compiler or uh, TypeScript, something like that, you, you do need to, it, it's harder to, you need to define a special type for the object. So another alternative for that, if, if you can't pass an object or you're not willing to, or in the language that you use, there's really no convention to pass object parameters to a function, you could still pass your arguments, but at least annotate them like that, one per line, and add a comment. This pattern has been used a lot in, in the C++ world and uh, other languages. Uh, it's nothing new, but consider doing that. Lastly, uh, don't try to play code golf. Uh, your goal is not to write, implement your, your, your logic in as few number of lines or characters as possible. We're not playing that game. It's all about the readability. Um, so in the end, I just want to talk about how, how we can get better at writing readable code. Obviously, I just scratched the surface, gave you a list of my favorite things to, uh, to rant about. But um, here's this book that I found out that I started reading. Uh, it's got pretty good advice. I used some of the ideas from that book and this presentation. It's called The Art of Readable Code. Uh, you can buy it on O'Reilly or Amazon, and there's even a free online version. Uh, another way you can actually practice it don't be shy in asking for feedback in code reviews, and I hope that you all do code reviews in your team. And it goes both ways. If you are unsure about a good name, leave a comment on your pull request soliciting feedback. Hey, I, I really, I'm really not sure about this method. Can you suggest a better name? And then as a reviewer, I don't think it's nitpicking. I think it's important to suggest better names if you feel like that name is really confusing, it, it's ambiguous. And another website that I really like is Exorcism IO. Anybody heard of it? Oh, awesome. So the idea of this website is you, um, you have a series of programming exercises. They're relatively simple, and you can use it just to learn the language, but another way you can use it is uh, you implement a simple programming exercise, maybe writing a string for 100 times and writing different strings, but uh, you can try to implement something simple but in a very clear, structured, and idiomatic way using whatever your fa favorite design principles are, object-oriented, functional. And then you submit that code and you get feedback, they call it nitpicking, from, from other users. And because the whole purpose of this exercise is to write clear, idiomatic code, uh, it's, a, it's a good way to practice this on a small scale. <laughs> Lastly, here's some more resources that I have in my presentation. Uh, Idiomatic JS that I mentioned, must read for all JavaScript developers. Uh, a few other uh, useful articles. Uh, I, I already posted the presentation on GitHub, so um, here's a link to it. Um, follow me on Twitter. Check out Lucid at golucid.co if you're interested about our company. We're always hiring. We're starting our recruiting season now. And uh, thanks.